Erin, thank you so much for being here. Thanks for inviting me. So at Autodesk, you founded the generative design practice. Can you talk to me a bit about that? Sure. So. Um, Co-founded, co and that's because um, generative design is a synthesis of technology. So it involves high-performance computing, it involves artificial intelligence, and then it also involves a new way of thinking about design. So um, I am on the new way of thinking for design. My background is human and computer interaction. Um, my colleagues in our science office developed the high-performance computing background to run the algorithms that synthesize design. Fascinating. And so what are some, um, for everyone watching, what are some like practical applications of how generative design is used? Okay, so you, in traditional CAD, you come up with the idea. And then what you do is really just transcribe that idea into a CAD tool in points and lines and surfaces. So practical applications for generative design is you not needing to come up with that solution. What you do is you say, I need this chair to support the weight of a 250 pound person and I need it to be 18 inches off the ground. You give that information to the algorithm and it synthesizes the solution for you. So no longer, in terms of democratizing technology, no longer do you, the engineer or the designer, need to uh, explore the solution space. An algorithm can do that for you. It's fascinating. And it seems like you know at Autodesk, there are so many converging technologies coming together. Right. Yeah. Can you talk to me a bit about the power of these technologies um, coming together under Autodesk? The, what we're seeing is, um, fundamentally a convergence of manufacturing and design because it's no longer sufficient for a design engineer or designer to um, conceive of a design, even cat it and then throw it over the transom to an engineer to determine how to fabricate it. So when CAD tools have an awareness of different manufacturing methods, then they're able to suggest shapes that will be easy to fabricate. For example, we're developing um, features in our generative design technology that will give you shapes that you can make on a three-axis mill. If you say, I have a five-axis mill, then it will give you shapes that have a bit more refined geometry because a five-axis mill can produce more refined shapes. And is there a project you're working on right now that you feel most excited about that you can share with us right now? Oh, okay. <laughs> so I can't share. Yeah, I know it's a hard question. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the, the one that we've had um, have quite a bit of excitement around has been um, a project called the Hack Rod. Um, it's called the Hack Rod because we're taking sensor data and we're hacking the shape of a chassis for a roadster, for a, for a hot rod. Mm -hmm. um, what we did is we took an existing chassis and we put uh, 60 odd sensors on it and we drove it. And we took the data, the sensor data, so what's the forces on this part of the chassis? What's the magnitude of those forces? Um, we fed that into our generative design algorithm and it suggested hundreds of solutions, three of which we entertain fabricating. One was titanium, but there's no titanium printer big enough to make it. Um, and another was aluminum. We just wanted to see what that would look like and what the um, light weighting results would be. And then the other that we ended up fabricating is in um, a beam and node based design. So think of erector sets. Okay. So it solved for the loads by creating this node and beam shape that we were able to fabricate with a conventional method of chromoly tubes, just welding tubes together. Um, so the reason I think that's exciting is one, it's this race car that we made, an entire chassis. Yeah. We made it in a way that the fabricators were really excited about because they said, we don't need to go find some exotic large-scale printer that in fact doesn't even exist yet or print it in parts and then weld it together. We can print it, uh, we can use these shapes that you've designed for us with conventional methods of chromoly tubes. 
And so, so a lot of this sounds like coming up with very creative solutions as well. And so have there been any technical roadblocks that the process of overcoming has been really interesting or has like led you to another solution? From where I sit, as I said, my background is in human computer interaction. Yeah. I, I would say the roadblocks have been primarily the human roadblocks. And I'm not saying that, yeah. uh, uh, that people aren't willing to adopt it. In fact, yeah. um, uh, people are really enthusiastic about the technology, but just um, asking people to change the way they think about their design yeah. process is, it's a big ask. Mm -hmm. um, and we are, as engineers, we're taught to converge on a solution fast, and we find that solution as quickly and efficiently as possible. This process says, no, really get clear about your design problem and define it with all the constraints that you need to introduce to it, and let the system diverge. Find a yeah. lot of different solutions in that space, and, let, and then you, as the final arbiter of what solution's gonna work for you, what trade-offs are you willing to make, you pick a solution. So in terms of the, the roadblock, it's asking people to step back, focus and abstract their design problem yeah. to one of physics. What are the loads? Um, what are the thermal conditions this is operating under? Um, and define those in a way that the system can understand. Um, people are certainly you know, interested and willing to do this, but it takes a little uh, it takes a little time to reconceive of your design process in a generative design workflow. Yeah, it seems like you know it's like with any behavior that you need to learn, it's definitely a process of adapting. It is, and. Um, when we were first working on this, there were folks who said, wow, this is a paradigm shift in CAD. <laughs> and, um, you know, I, possibly, but the more I thought about it, the more it appears to me to be an evolution. So we went from um, designing with just in CAD, 2D CAD, points and lines, to 3D modeling, so points and lines and surfaces and lofts and um, a full solid modeling um, and with parametrics. And now we're moving into this goal-oriented design process where you're abstracting yet again the way you think about your design problem, not 2D to 3D, but from um, points and surfaces to goals and constraints. Fascinating. And so um, I wanted to ask you, as a woman senior in technology and passionate about STEM yeah. um, and STEM for girls, um, yeah. yeah, like what are what are some lessons you've learned maybe about being a woman in technology that you would want to share? One of the things that has um, been really exciting about working at Autodesk is the technology is is not necessarily the that it's a means to the to an end mm -hmm. and and that's what's really gets me excited is yes we have these tools but look what we can do with these tools so for example at Autodesk we have a um, we have a design gallery where we feature the design work of all of our customers um, and that when you walk into this gallery you see um, the most amazing architecture. You see the hot rod. You see work in bio nano and um, 3D printing. And it's those stories. It's the people who are taking the technology and innovating, solving problems for um, uh, for the countries and, and those who don't have as much um, access to technology that we do. That really excites me and. I think as a woman in technology, I have two girls, their curiosity and their motivations come from solving human problems. Not the source of their energy and passion is not necessarily in solving technical problems. Yeah. And so when we can reframe STEM in terms of solving human problems 
and you know, improving humanity, then I, that is what excites girls and women in tech. Yeah, that's wonderful. I think that that reframing, it, do, it makes it more personal. It makes technology more approachable. Yeah. I think period. Um, and so I also want to talk about um, a theme of science fiction has been continuously coming up with yeah. a lot of the um, people we've been interviewing. Does science fiction impact any of your work or any of Autodesk's work? Yeah, so when um, we, I work in the office of the CTO, um, so that's our event technology group, and um, some of us are working on the you know three to five year horizon, some on the ten year horizon, but there are others in our group that are working on the hundred year horizon. Wow! And the tools of their trade is science fiction. Yeah. So they work um, with professional science fiction um, writers and illustrators and storytellers to to craft these um, these vignettes about what life will be like in the future, what design will be like in the future, what our built environment will be like in the future. And those sci-fi stories start to become reality yeah. faster than <laughs> we can imagine. And I don't need to tell you that here at an exponential technology yeah. conference, right? Um, but even just yesterday, if you heard Peter Diamandis, um, yeah. you know, he spoke to us about wanting to take you know, a component here and a component here and have an AI design the solution in between and have it account for specific thermal properties. That's what, That's what we're doing. <laughs> yeah. you know, it does sound like sci-fi. Now he had yeah. an AI layer on it that we're not, you know, right. other parts in the organization are developing right now, but that, that's it. And yeah, it sounds like sci-fi, but in fact, it's happening now. Yeah, it's so exciting. I think uh, having someone whose job is looking at a hundred year horizon, I think like when you're talking before about um, the human obstacle, getting used to um, designing in a new way, yeah. it's also like how do we get our minds comfortable to step into such a different future? I think at this conference, a lot of it is kind of stepping into new technologies right. and new paradigms. Right, and um, one of our speakers yesterday talked about, um, yeah, this may sound very left coast, <laughs> you know, <laughs> which is, you know, a little bit of a, um, you know, a way to say, yeah, you know, I'm in California, Silicon Valley, you know, we, we have some harebrained ideas. What we're doing at conferences like this is we're normalizing those harebrained ideas because, in fact, things like you know understanding that our climate is in fact heating up. Yeah. Now, practically, how do we address um, issues in our infrastructure to prepare for that? How do we design for that? And um, those are some practical engineering approaches that we need to take to solve against these large exponential problems. And so another question I wanted to ask you is about um, the democratization of design. Um, democratization of technology is a big theme at Singularity University and that we talk about, um, but specifically with design, can you talk to me a bit about how that has been going in the industry? So when you say democratization of design, I think one thing that immediately comes to mind is access. Um, and so at Autodesk, every product we we produce is free to students and educators. Um, and it's amazing. It is amazing. <laughs> Thank it you. Amazing? That's amazing. Yes. Uh, and so getting these tools out into you know, into into the hands of students and in the hands of educators, especially who are able to really understand these new uh, workflows and and teach it to the next generation. Um, but also I think about, just last night I had a conversation with a, um, an engineer and he said, oh, as a hobbyist, I, I, I have a, um, a shop bot, which is a CNC machine, um, and I haven't done CNC, program CNC for 20 years, but I used an Autodesk tool called okay. Fusion, and it had built into it, it had um, CNC, so computer numeric controlled, okay. CNC controls, for operating machines like this. 
and he said it was unbelievable that he didn't have to a go back and dust off all his understanding of CNC, but also with a few clicks that he could take his the his design and fabricate it. So what that's doing is that it's enabling um, people to um, expand sort of their skill set when it would ordinarily require a cross-functional team to take it from design to fabrication. So there's an element of democratization in that that I think is very powerful. Now that doesn't yes. mean the CNC expert is out of a job. It means that they're focusing on really complex problems and telling us what needs to come next in yeah. our tool set, um, but that the designer can go ahead and have that power, that functionality within their tools so they can take their designs from concept to fabrication. And so um, design and manufacturing is really hitting new frontiers. Yeah. Do you have any like personal dreams or hopes where you'd love to see it in five years, ten years? Like what type of capabilities we might have? What types of capabilities? So one thing that I'd like to see is just having a better understanding of materials. Okay. Um, I am working with the um, Lawrence Livermore National Lab on some advanced work in materials. And uh, some of the, okay, this is left coast sort of <laughs> harebrained idea. It's okay. Yeah. <laughs> but some of the um, exciting things that um, I just seen on the horizon in materials are materials that can sense and actually adapt during use. So um, MIT has done some work on programmable carbon fiber, for example. And it's you know, a simple concept in that if you can have your carbon fiber structured such that it can respond to the environment, let's say it's pressure um, or heat, it can change its shape to better perform. So the example they use is a spoiler on the back of a race car and as the pressure increases it knows it needs to um, get, give more friction so the spoiler change shape um, on the vehicle and these materials um, changing shape responding to their use I think is going to fundamentally change design um, because you no longer are designing a static object. What you're designing yeah. is for that object responding to its environment over time. Yeah. And then manufacturing, you, it's hard to wrap our heads around how we make materials and formulate these shapes to respond to their environment. And that's yeah. exciting, scary, and I'm not sure how we fill in the gaps there. Yeah, I mean, I think that's incredibly exciting. Also, um, I've been reading a bit about like exoskeleton works um, that's, that are being built. And I think like if you had responsive materials that move with your body, that could be huge for people as well. I think it'll be you know, fundamentally you know, it change how people with, um, with disabilities or loss of limb yeah. engage with the environment. And even those who, who are, you know, fully able with their, um, how they engage, how they, um, how our, um, our warfighters fight and how in a daily basis, how we interact with our environment. Yeah, it's so exciting. Erin, I just want to thank you so much for taking this time and for everything you've shared. It's been an absolute pleasure talking with you. Thank you.